that he has an unlimited, uh, an unlimited amount of compassion for people. One who has, knows no end to patience, whose integrity is beyond question, and as far as the political arena in this country is concerned, his judgment is valued in the area of agriculture. And so let me introduce to you a man who has dedicated his life to the service of American agriculture and more in particular to you and I in this organization. Your national president, Ornley Staley. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, members of the Board of Directors and Department Heads, delegates and guests of this convention. This night is a night that I've worked and waited for for 23 years. For 20 years, we have been on the collective bargaining road to get farmers in a position to price their products. And that road many times has been very uncertain and pretty rough. But there were several things that we had to do in order to be in the position we are tonight. First, we had to have a program. We had to fight for recognition, and the holding action was the only way. And it left blemishes, because people didn't understand that it was a fight for recognition. And then when we started delivering products in late 1964 and early 1965, on verbal agreements. We did not have the, the staff or the logistics or even an agreement that we could prove because it was verbal. And as our members went to the various companies with their products, particularly Hawks, they did not get the price they expected and it was not very long until they got prices far below what they could get at home. And the company buyers cutely told them, if you hadn't have come through NFO, we could have paid you a quarter more. And that necessitated putting together collection points without buyers from companies in those points. It made it necessary for grain accumulation points and milk reloads, and then a long, hard fight for written contracts in 1968. 52 days. And then a fast growth, one that we could not back up with the logistics, the trained personnel, the computerized systems and all. In late 1971, we got the best firm we could to get the firm that could set up a computerized system. They told us it would take five years. It took all of that, long, hard, dreadful years. And then the step of getting enough professional people that could assist us as farmers of putting together a team that could get the right hogs to the right plant, the right cattle to the right plant, taking advantage of the quality of grain as we build the program from farm storage, and a system that could gain quality control that was necessary on milk, and then the improvements of contracts. And tonight I can stand before you 
and tell you that I believe almost without exception that the members of the NFO are getting the best prices available of any farmers in this country for their products. And where they are not, it's because we need additional volume. Because you cannot bargain with an empty bucket or a wheelbarrow full. You have to have enough production to do a job of bargaining that the production represents enough volume that the companies cannot fulfill their needs from other sources. And that you can also at the same time now have the ability, have the ability to deliver the right hogs to the right plant or the right cattle or the grain or the milk and thus, in doing that, performing the services for companies that cannot be performed any other way. And that we have the capability of doing that and are doing it. As you talk to the other delegates here and the other people, and I've been a lot of places in the last 90 days, that's on many farms. Some 100, over 100 really, individual farms in eight different states. I have been meeting with young farmers working to set up a young farmer's structure to back us all up to get this job done. And I hope that I have the ability tonight to prove to you, if you have any doubts, that I and many others can just almost touch the victory we've long sought. And that I can have the ability to explain to you what has to be done and how to do it and to touch for a moment also on the necessity. I doubt if any of us realize the importance of this meeting. I doubt if any of us realize what we're going to do or what we do not do whichever way it happens, will affect our destiny, the destiny of farmers, our grandchildren, and generations to come. And I'm not here to try to make an emotional speech. I want it to be logically stated and understandable. First, back to our structure, our system, and our prices. I never thought that we would be in the position in a competitive price situation as we are tonight in most of our programs in almost every area until we had master contracts that were at the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. But in the last year, on cattle, we have improved our formulations at a minimum of three to four dollars a hundredweight in our cattle contracts. The other day, I know of a farmer who had been an NFO member that maybe participated along the time some way. I'm not sure, 
But I know that the price he received that he could have gotten on 90 head of cattle alone, $2,000 a head more. Just going through the NFO. As you go to the cattle commodity meeting tomorrow, you will hear a report of what they've been able to do last week in dairy cows, cow cows. We have improved in the hogs some 40 to 50 cents a hundred weight on our formulation in the last year, plus additional transportation allowances. In grain, depending on the volume, and the transportation available on how it's to be done, you'll know that in many areas, as you talk to the members, that they have been doing an excellent job. And I can tell you tonight that because of our capabilities and quality control, that the difference between the best dairy program in this nation and what was at one time a very poor program and then a mediocre program that we have available to us the best dairy program beyond a question of a doubt. Because in dairy, it's the key outlets that you have, not too many of them. And I can tell you, without in any way hedging at all, that we can take almost over almost every one of the key dairy outlets in this country tomorrow morning if we get the milk behind us that we need. And most of you know the improvement. It used to be that we had to haul the milk a long distance to a buyer that nobody else wanted and we paid the transportation besides. Today the list of dairy companies that we have contractual arrangements with are unlimited and as well as in the other commodities the honor roll of companies that buy products in this country. It comes down to what do we have to do? How do we do it? There's a couple of three things that are very vital and very important. One is we've been on the defensive so long that we haven't talked to anybody else. So our confidence and our pride has to be restored and the will to win. But why does it have to be restored and how can it be done? It can be done on the basis of what I'm saying is the programs, if they're right, they stand on their own feet. And I wouldn't be here tonight standing here and telling you that if I was not convinced and that you would be convinced by talking to people in other areas. And so the strategy that we have to use if you have not had enough volume in a certain commodity or maybe two or three of the commodities, that you have to zero in and build the volume on the ones that are working the best in the area and then build the others as we go along. But to zero our efforts and give our top priorities, all of us, to the programs that are working the best because of the contracts we have. And I'll tell you why we have the contracts we have. It's because we're giving the best type of services to many of the companies in this country that they can possibly get. Let me start off for a moment with the cow cows. 
The cow cows in this country make up almost 30% of the beef. that's produced in this country that the consumers eat. How do the packers get the, the cull cows? The cull cows are never gathered together in very great numbers. It's at the sale barns. With the jockey or the trader or whoever it may be there that's picking them up, maybe there's 10 there one week and 100 the next week, and no packer can afford to send a packer buyer to those points, to those buying stations or whatever it may be, or to the sale barns, because of the unpredictability of the number there. And besides that, if you're a cow killer, you want uniformity of as much as you can get, so that you're talking about the type of beef that you want to sell and that you, can uh, that you can develop outlets for. And so off of the farmers comes 20, 25 dollars a head usually, maybe more. And they put all of them together into a semi of all weights, descriptions, and they go to a packer somewhere. We, through our collection points system, can bring the cows in of approximate same weight, same description on one day and on another day bring in the others. And that means that we're giving the service to packers they can't get anywhere else because of the volume and because of the uniformity. And we've got the only system in this nation that can do that on a volume basis. There's no other. On hogs, the necessity of establishing graders that can sort the hogs so that they will also be going to the right plant that we can take one semi sorted to one plant and another semi to another plant and another semi to another plant out of the same collection point and end up with the type, the carcass weight, all graded with great uniformity. In grain, the best grain in this country almost without exception, is the farm stored grain. Did you ever try your local elevator to take some grain in and get it back and compare the quality? That's what other people have to buy and compare that to your bins that you have on your farm. With the capability of direct exports, and a volume and quantity. In dairy, the strict quality control programs that buyers tell me of major companies that we are now performing the best in many cases of anybody they buy from. But to have collective bargaining you have to be able to deliver a product. And you have to be able to deliver in volume. And you have to be able to put enough volume together that a plant cannot get that supply somewhere else. And part of the reason the price that you're going to hear about on the cows and the cattle meeting tomorrow will be because I'm told that day we had 5% of the total supply just that day going through our system. That's enough for somebody that's a volume buyer to want that volume when he can depend on it being there and it's uniform, it can, isn't it, right? Sure. We know it is. You know it is. So that's the system of the structure with the computerized systems, with the counting offices over the country, 
And if there's a lag, it means a little more push in the personnel to be a little more prompt, but the system is there. It's proven itself. The credit and the collection part. These are details, but these are details that we must know and we must understand. Today, it is not the battle with the companies in this country, in my estimation. We got first, first got recognition and then written contracts, and now we are satisfying with the, our ability and capabilities to deliver the type of product that companies need that practically every major company in dairy, meat, grain. That means hogs and cattle and a great job just done in Montana delivery that the members of Montana should be congratulated for some 21 or 22,000 head of forward contracted calves. A period of about three weeks. Forward contracted, many of them were under the market of that day, but they made a commitment and they lived by it. And they delivered. I guess without any defaults to my knowledge. So it means that you have to decide what you're going to do, you're going to have to make commitments, and you're going to have to live by those commitments. And now how do we do it? But I guess first I'd want to say, why should we do it? Not for me, not for the board of directors, but for yourselves and every other farmer throughout this country. What does farm power mean? It's not power for an individual. It's not power for a small group. But it's putting together enough strength that can make it possible for the farmers of this country and ranchers and growers to go to the marketplace with equal strength of four or five large companies that will buy, own, control, and sell 50 to 70 percent of the nation's total production. Whether it be in hogs, cattle, milk products, or grain. How can we not realize that we cannot as an individual or as a state or as a group of states be able out on our farm or our ranch, maybe selling to somebody that we think is competing with somebody on down the road, but the fact that four or five large companies will buy, own, control, and sell 50 to 70 percent of the total production. That doesn't mean that all of their combined strength can keep the farmers from pricing their products if they unite 30 percent of their production. And I have written commitments and many verbal commitments from major companies that have said or written that they would either bargain on cost of production plus reasonable profit contracts or would sign them. The major companies, if we put together 30 percent of the nation's total production, that they would have no choice and their only concern was whether their competitors could buy cheaper. So what else is there? What other ingredient do we need? The other ingredient that we need 
is an army of farmers and ranchers going out of this convention determined that that farm power and that meeting we had in Des Moines, Iowa, we said that we were going for 30 percent of the nation's total production by March 1st and cost of production plus reasonable profit contracts. If we were not going to do that, and if we just went to Des Moines on August 3rd and had a meeting and had no intention of getting that 30 percent put together by March 1st, then we should have never had that meeting in Des Moines. And we should have never made that commitment. Because if we didn't mean it, then we were pretty foolish, weren't we? And if we were just going to make a marketing group out of the organization, or if we were going to shy away from the challenge that is before us, then a lot of us have, have wasted a lot of our life. And there wouldn't have been a lot of people on this stage that are here tonight if they hadn't have believed you in Des Moines because I said that if you're not going to do it, many had asked me to say it in Des Moines, if you're not going to do it, tell us so we can go back to our farms too. And I mean that tonight on behalf of a lot of people. You've got a group of people that will fight their heart out. but it takes other people helping. And I've written publicly that we don't have the staff in numbers to do much more than is being done. So it means that the people here are going to have to decide how important it is to do what I believe has to be done. Why have a lot of us stayed in there? I guess there were two reasons, or three reasons. One is, when the NFO started, we were fighting for our lives as World War II veterans. We had come out of the service after having gone into the service, and when we had to start replacing the cattle and hogs and the equipment and everything else that we had when we went into the service, it was two, three, or four times as high as it was when we went in. And we got caught in a cost price squeeze. And I believe we had an effect The other thing, we believe in the cause of people, the fairness, the justice. And I suppose the underlying factor may be back of that, that we are just plain group of people, farmers and ranchers that we're proud to be, that just don't like to lose and didn't intend to. And so now we're down to the time that we have to make further decisions. And I think a lot of people do not realize what's happening to their next door neighbors, to their own sons and daughters, 
because I've been out there and we've got two an economic strata difference in agriculture like we've never had before. And that economic strata difference is this. Most of the farmers, 45 and over, feel very comfortable. They bought land that today is five times, ten times, maybe what it was worth when they bought it. And so their financial statement's very good. They stayed alive, you know. And that's about all you had to do in a lot of ways. You had to be a good operator, but not all that good maybe either. When you look back, you had some elbow room each year because your financial statement was a little better if you're in that age category. And then there's the young farmers in this country, our sons and our daughters, and the neighbor boy that grew up that we liked so well as a cute boy and as we saw him progress knowing he was going to make a good farmer that the young farmers in this country have got their backs to the wall. Their cash flow does not equal their costs. It's not their fault. Oh, yes, I hear some of the older farmers say, yes, if they lived like we live, they'd be all right. Yeah, we could tighten our belts and save $1,000 a year and make it. But if you're going to have modern agriculture, you've got to have the size of equipment to farm enough land in order to pay for the equipment. And if some of the young people don't do that, the people in this nation won't be fed and a lot of people throughout the world. You can't take a hoe and a scoop shovel and operate enough land in this country today and all those people that are griping about the cost of food, which is the best buy in this nation, only 16% of the disposable income of the people in this country goes for food, and 20% released last week in figures goes for financial costs, including payments and interest. Food's the best buy in this nation. But I'll tell you why you have to have the large equipment to farm the land in this country. Yes, the farm folks might be willing to go out with a hoe and a scoop shovel, but I'll tell you those city people that are critical of the farm cost and critical of the price of food aren't going to come out and help you. So they've got a choice of either to pay for your cost of production plus a reasonable profit or grab a scythe along with a scoop shovel and a hoe and come out and help. And they'll pay the price like they've paid for their boats and everything else in this country. And so it comes down so how does it affect you? I wish that you could have been a little mouse, the parents of some of the young farmers that I've sat down in conferences of six and eight at a time and ten. And I wouldn't have to be making this speech tonight because I know what they're saying because first I've convinced them that I know what their problems are and secondly that I'm not looking down upon them but I'm treating them as my equal and with respect and I don't get involved in the discussions I listen as they open their hearts to each other and 
I'll tell you in this hall tonight and farmers throughout this country, there's a lot of parents, if they knew how close those sons and daughters were to leaving because of the financial pressure where the cash flow doesn't meet their expenses, you'd be shuddering in your seats tonight. And I know firsthand experience that that's right. And you can say your children are spending too much. They don't have control over it. They're going to farm. And they've got an attitude which I don't believe is wrong. And that attitude is if they can't have a standard of living equal to other people in this economy with their ability, they're going to leave. I'll tell you, when they do leave, there's going to be a lot of parents that are going to have the greatest drudgery they ever had in their lives and the biggest disappointments of their lives. But they feel now that they have got an ideal set up that they can work when they want to, Yes, dig in into the time of harvest planting and extra, but their children are running the farm. What happens after that? You're not talking just about your children. That little grandson or that little granddaughter that is living close by goes with them. Mom and Papa stay behind with all the drudgery, and I've seen it happen. And I've seen it happen too much. And I don't want it to happen in our family because I didn't give it all. And I don't think that you want it to happen in your family because you didn't make the right decision at the right time. I have said over TV and radio several times here in St. Louis that I believe half of the young farmers in this nation are just on the verge of leaving the farm and the land. And if that should happen, it will be as serious and maybe more so than if half of the doctors disappeared tomorrow morning in this country, or half of the scientists, or half of the engineers, or all of them put together. Because that's our food factory and the management for it for years to come and from now on. I hope you reflect on that. Put it in your own community. And if you take 10 young farmers out of a township in your county and most counties, very shortly, the agriculture in that township would collapse. And then what happens to your land prices? Yes, there's a lot of people optimistic about the foreign buyers. They're optimistic about the fact that it looks like land is going to continue to go up. I'm not here to predict tonight what will happen or what will happen, but I read the other day what I believe is right. Just as soon as the investors ever get in a position that the land value is not continuing to go up, they'll start dumping the land because they're not going to take a three, three and a half percent return on the investment of renting it. They're keeping it not because of the return on the investment, they're keeping it 
for a hedge against inflation and increased value. But you let them start selling it, and I'll tell you what will happen. You better beat your neighbors to selling because your financial statement's not going to look so good very quickly. Because it will go to the value of productivity. And that value, I can tell you, is not nearly what it's bringing today. And you will not have the young farmers to buy. And with the investors getting out, and with the turnaround in the dollar, as it comes, it may have a reflection on a lot of other things unexpected. I'm not here trying to convince you of that tonight. All I'm trying to do is to get you look, to look it straight in the face. To look it as it is. And for you to decide what it's worth in effort and everything else to back it up when we're that close. There's a lot of you that were fearful to talk because you were afraid something was going to happen. But with a system and structure that's never been equal in this nation, that with the professional people helping us represent the farmers at the marketplace, and I hope that the farmers really know what their products are bringing. I'm not going to really stress that. But as we've improved our prices, weights went down in other places to compete sometimes. I'm not going to talk about that because you won't believe me. You'll say it's an excuse. I made a flat statement here tonight that almost without exception, NFO where members are receiving the best prices for their products and I'm not going to hedge one way or another on it. And you're going to find it out in this hall tomorrow in the commodity meetings as you talk. Oh yes, there will be a few places and I gave for a few exceptions. There's not going to be very many, but in your area there is some commodity that is working very, very well. If you've got even a decent volume. Now we'd be a little foolish, wouldn't we, to go out and just, if all the commodities aren't moving because of the volume involved, we'd better improve the one we've gotten, tie it down quickly, and move on to the others, hadn't we? That's smart. What's the use to overload a program in an area that there's not enough experience background or we haven't had enough volume. Let's build the volume a little there, but let's skyrocket the volume where the commodity programs are working and play it smart. And build our strength, and from that strength built, our weaknesses will be improved. How much time have we got till the first day of March? Not long, have we? How are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Well, there's a few categories that we have to divide. And we have to divide this convention down into a working force to a small enough achievable unit to make all those units big successes. I've heard the cheers over the years and the pledges. I just never wanted to be around to the confessions where people didn't follow through. So this convention 
in the commodity programs as they are discussed tomorrow in the commodity meetings, there's going to be a sheet of paper that's a pledge. But it's not a one-sentence pledge. First, you sign your name. You put down your address, your county, and your telephone number. Please turn the tape over to side number two.